much, everybody, for giving the way you did. Uh, one quick announcement here, um, or two, two quick announcements. If you have not listened to the past two sessions, or the past few sessions, I want to encourage you to catch up on our live, on our YouTube channel. Um, have really heard a lot of feedback from last Sunday that I think people's eyes were open. Sometimes when you're preaching, you can tell if people are not getting it. And you can tell when people are getting it. I feel like last Sunday, people really, the light was going on that off that how we are joined to the Spirit of God. Our human spirit is joined to the Spirit of God, which is an incredible, incredible thing. So I want to encourage you, if you have missed those, to catch up because it really is life-changing, not because of me, of course, but of course, it's the Word of the Lord, it's the Scriptures that are life-changing. Um, if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and turn to... 2 Peter 1, verse 3, and the title of this session is uh, part, this is session 4, Hindrances to Abiding, Hindrances to Abiding, session 4, Hindrances to Abiding, and you know, we've, we've spent a lot of the last three sessions talking about the abiding life that Jesus calls us to live, but what you'll find out is there are hindrances that will keep you from the abiding life. We're going to spend about four weeks talking about the different hindrances that can hinder us and stop us from abiding in Christ. So 2 Peter chapter, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, and I, I just, it's an it's a incredible scripture. We'll start with verse 1. But Simon Peter is writing, and he says, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. So Peter is basically saying if you're born again, you have received faith. Not just that you have faith, but you've actually received faith. It's the faith of the Son of God. It's the very faith that Peter the water walker had is in you because Christ is in you. The very faith that the apostles walked in to do miracles is now in you because Christ is in you. You have the very faith of the Son of God inside of you. In fact, in uh, the fruits of the Spirit, one of the fruits of the Spirit is faith. It's the faith of the Son of God is in you. Now, Peter says this is by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He goes on to say, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And this is where I'm really trying to get us to, verse 3. Seeing that His divine power... And this is where we need to get seeing is we need to see this, not just know it, not just have it in our head. We need to see it. We need to see it. The eyes of our heart need to be opened that his divine power, his dunamis powers, the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead has granted to you it's past tense. It's been done. If you're born again, it's accomplished in your human spirit. His divine power, his dunamis power has granted to you, listen, everything, not just some things, not just the little things, everything, everything. You lack nothing. I don't care if you've only been born again for a week or if you've been saved for 50 years, I don't care if you struggled for 25 years going around the same mountain. If you're truly born of the Holy Spirit, if Christ truly lives inside of you, if your spirit is truly joined to the Spirit of God, if the Spirit of God has been grafted to your human spirit, God's divine nature is now uh, you, are, you are now a partaker of the divine nature of Jesus Christ by your human spirit. And that means everything has been granted to you that you need for life and godliness. That's incredible. You don't lack anything. Well, what's my problem? We're going to get into your problem over the next four weeks. Because, you know, you do have a problem. I've arrived, but you have a problem. No, I'm kidding. 
We all have a problem. We all realize, okay, there's something not, okay, this is true, right? This is true. God's divine power has granted to you everything pertaining to life and godliness. Everything you need to live a godly life is now inside of you because Christ is inside of you. You lack nothing. You lack nothing. Everything you need to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ is right here in your spirit because Christ is now right here in your spirit. Your spirit is now joined to the Holy Spirit as one spirit. Your spirit and the Holy Spirit are now one spirit. They cannot be separated. It's grafted. God is grafted to your human spirit. You are joined as one spirit to the spirit of Jesus Christ. You have everything you need for life and godliness. So then what is your problem? Okay, that's what we're going to talk about. There are hindrances to the abiding life. There are hindrances to the abiding life that the Lord must prune out. The Lord has to cut down and cut away these hindrances that are hindering and suppressing the life of God in you from being released fully. And that's what we're going to talk about. This session, we're just going to give an overview of that. We're going to talk about just an introduction here of, of, of what some concepts we need to understand, some concepts we need to learn, uh, you know, such as there are two life sources in you. There's, we'll get into this in detail, but there's there's, there's Christ in your spirit and self-life in your soul, and you have two life sources you can choose to live by. We're going to look about, uh, there's two states of a believer. You can be carnal or spiritual. And we're going to talk about what it looks like to be a spiritual Christian and what it means for the Word of God to come and divide your soul from your spirit to partition it so you can see the difference and the distinction between your spirit and your soul. In, in session five, the session next Sunday, we're going to look at five hindrances to abiding, which are natural strength, self-reliance, the rational mind, emotions and experiences, and the body. And then in session six, we're going to look at the carnal mind, how mindsets of the flesh, because Paul said, the one who sets his mind on the flesh will live according to the flesh. If your mind is set on the things of the flesh, you're going to live in the flesh. But if your mind is set on the things of the spirit, you're going to live in the spirit. Carnal mindsets can be a hindrance to you living in the spirit. And then in session seven, we're going to look at heart beliefs, different beliefs in your heart that you can believe that are not rooted in the truth, that are rooted in lies, that are hindering the life of God from being released within you. So that is, that is where we're going but back here to Peter, Peter says in verse 3, seeing that his divine power has granted, past tense, just like Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. When the Holy Spirit came to dwell in your human spirit, the work in your spirit was finished. That work was done. Has granted, past tense, the work is complete. His power has given you everything for life and godliness. You have everything you need. So this means, what this means is that now, if you learn how to live by the indwelling life of Christ, uh, the indwelling life of Jesus Christ, that you can naturally produce the, the, the fruit of Jesus Christ without striving, without toiling, but by abiding. You can naturally be a person who has the love of, of Jesus flowing out of you, the joy of Jesus flowing out of you, the peace of Christ uh, flowing out of you, the faith of Christ flowing out of you. This means you can now experience deep intimacy and communion with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. You can, ha you can really, this is true, you can know the Lord inwardly deeper and more personally than you know any single other person in this life, including your spouse and children. You really can know God in that deeper way because he lives here. You can know the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in an ever-increasing way. You can feast daily upon his word and his voice that that would be the substance you live by and that nourishes you, that spiritual substance you live by. You can experience peace 
when the world around us, which is certainly happening, is spinning into chaos. I mean, if you haven't seen it, it's, the world has gone mad. The world is reeling. The world has gone insane. But you don't have to be that way because you have peace inside of you. The peace of Jesus Christ is in you. Even if you f- might feel anxious, that, those, that, that you don't have to live anxious. You don't have to live afraid because the peace of The Prince of Peace himself lives on the inside of you. This means that even if the world is going mad and crazy, you can have the joy of the Lord. You don't have to walk around depressed and mopey and sad because of all that's going on. The joy of the Lord is in you because he's in you. And he can give you his joy in full. This means you have overcoming faith no matter what you feel like. No matter if your emotions are saying, I can't do it, I'm far from God, I will never be what he wants me to be, I'm, over, I'm being overcome instead of being an overcomer, the truth is, is you have the faith of the Son of God inside of you because he is in you. This means you already have God's love right here. You have God's love. You have all the love of God you need to love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You have all the love of God you need to love others as Jesus has loved you. Now, sometimes it doesn't work itself out quite like it should, as we all know. But the truth is, you don't need God to give you more love. You need the love he's given you to be released without hindrance from the inside out. See, a lot of times we're trying to think, okay, I need more love. God, send me more love like God's just going to pour out a baptism of the Holy Spirit upon you. I'm not saying he never ever does that, but I would say look inwardly first and see God himself is love, and he says to put on love because you can't put on love if you don't have love. But he says in Colossians, put on love, put on a heart of love. You've got it. You've got it. You know, you've already got the patience you need, you know, You've got the patience you already need because he's in you. You've got that. You've got humility. You've got everything you need to shine as a bright light in a dark world. You have everything you need right now. You don't need anything else. Okay, you don't need me to come and lay hands on you, okay, to impart something that God's already imparted to you. What you need to learn how to do is to release The life of Christ, and that doesn't mean there's never times of impartation or laying on of hands. That's not true. But I'm saying, I wanted to say, you've got it right now. You've got it. You don't need an apostle or prophet to come and do something for you. You've got it because you have Christ in you. And and, And the secret is learning to release that the life of Christ inward to release it outward. But there are hindrances that must be overcome. It's the challenge The great challenge we have are the hindrances, okay? Then what is the problem? Okay, so you're telling me that I have all this stuff in me, not stuff, I have the the person of Jesus Christ in me, and because he's in me, I have all of the nature and the victory and the attributes and the character of Jesus Christ already in me, then what is the problem? Because I'm struggling, (laughs) I'm struggling with mindsets. I'm struggling with control. I'm struggling with lust. I'm struggling with pride. I'm struggling with jealousy or competition or anger or whatever it would be, judgment or whatever it is. I'm struggling with these things, but you're telling me I've already got everything I need. Then what is my problem? Okay, that's what we're going to look at in this session. So as we come to talk about living by the indwelling life of Christ, what we're going to realize is we have two life sources within us. We have the life of Christ, which is in your spirit. And whatever, when when, when Christ in you is allowed to live unhindered, then the nature and the character and the instincts of Jesus Christ are going to flow out of you organically to where he's living instead of you. So you're not trying to be patient. You're not trying to love but you're, you're loving and you're patient because Christ is living in you and not yourself. So you're not trying to be patient. You're not trying to love. You're not trying to have joy. You're not trying to have peace. What you're doing is you're letting Christ, who is peace, who is love, who is joy, to be the one that lives rather than you. 
And we've got a whole session on living. Are you living for God or are you living from God? Because most of the church says, okay, we've got to work on this patience issue. We've got to work on this love issue. We've got to work on this joy issue. And that's really the wrong thing to say. What we need to focus on is letting Christ live. And if he lives, he's naturally, organically going to be expressing love and patience through you and in you, not you trying. The other, the other life source that we have is that we have self-life in the soul. Now, all of us probably are aware of self-life in the soul. It's the self wanting to get what self wants. I want what I want, when I want it, how I want it done. I want my way or the highway. I want to live rather than him. You know, that, that selfishness that we are very much familiar with, that self-life in the soul uh, that lives, that, that whenever the self-life in the soul lives, human wisdom, independence, rebellion, hostility to God, that will be the natural fruit of self-life. So you have, as a born-again Christian, two choices to live by. So let's show the diagram here of the uh, two different lives of, uh, of self-life in the soul. Um, and if you, if you notice, you know, we, if you, this is the diagram that I think has really helped a lot of people to conceptually see what the, the things you can't see look like. And so... Self-life is that, is that life in the soul, the soul and the heart, which the heart is part of the soul. I just distinguish them. But that soul life, that self-life, that, you know, that, that self-living instead of Christ living, that, that is what self-life is. And so there's a couple things I want to say in the slides here is that both of these life sources have an inherent nature with different instincts and character. Whatever life source you draw from will, listen, effortlessly produce the fruit of that life. If you live from, the, from self without any effort, you're going to produce the nature of the self, of self. And those are the deeds of the flesh. Lust, anger, pride, idolatry, uh, factions, jealousy, judgment. That, that's, if you live self-life in the soul, if self lives without you even trying, you're naturally going to produce that fruit without trying. It just, it just na ha naturally happens. It's the way the suke, soul life, self-life in the soul, that's the way it functions. However, if Christ is living and not you, then without effort... Okay, I'm not saying there's not effort to get to the place where Christ must live. There is. Renewing the mind, renewing the heart, uh, learning to meditate, learn, spending, you know, time in, much time in prayer. There's a, we'll get into all that. Uh, the application of the cross, the inward cross life, all that's necessary. But, but what I mean is this, when Christ in you is truly living and you have been crucified experientially with Jesus Christ and it's the life he's now living in you, this fruit, you don't have to spin and toil to produce the fruit. It comes without effort. Just like a branch abiding in the vine bears fruit. The, the branch does not toil. The branch does not spin. The branch does not try. The branch abides. The branch is connected. And through that connection, the life of God, uh, and as it relates to us, the life of God without effort produces in you the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control. So when you live by Christ, you are organically, naturally, without effort, going to produce the fruit of the Spirit. It's His nature, His instincts flowing out of you without you trying to do it. You will naturally be an overcomer. You will overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. You will naturally, without effort, have communion with God and know the deep mysteries of God and know the revelation of God. But when you live by self-life... When self-life is living, when self is living and self is at the throne and self is enthroned in your heart, then you are going to naturally produce the sins of the flesh. You're going to be overcome by the world, the flesh, and the devil, and you're not going to be able to know God intimately. God can only be known spiritually, not soulishly. God can only be known in your spirit-to-spirit -spirit connection with him, and he can only be known here inwardly, not mentally. 
Now, that doesn't mean the mind doesn't have an involvement or a role in it. The mind does. But the, the spirit is where you commune with God. So now, let's turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 6, we're going to look at two verses. Matthew 16, 26, and Luke 9, 25. What I want you to see, because a lot of us don't understand um, from Scripture this concept or phrase, self-life in the soul. We want to see this. This is important. We want to see self-life is in the soul, that when, when Adam became a living soul, when Adam became a living soul, his self-life was then living rather than, you know, his, he didn't have Christ in him. He didn't have the life of God in him. He had self-life. And so here we see in Matthew chapter 16 is, is Matthew is recording what Jesus said. And he says, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? It's the word suke in the Greek. Now, it's very interesting in Luke 9, verse 25, Luke records the exact same statement by Jesus. It, listen to what Luke says and how he, how he translates, it, translates this. He says, what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Isn't that interesting? Matthew uses the word soul. Luke uses the word self. See, what this tells us, some will go, oh, well, you know, it's a mistake. No, it's not a mistake. It's by divine design, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to show us that self-life resides in the soul. Self-life, suke life, self-life resides in the soul. See, you could look at it like, like uh, Watchman Nee. I want to read this quote by Watchman Nee, and you can just show that on the screen. Is Watchman Nee was writing about this in his book, The Spiritual Man, which if you want to feel really bad about your spiritual life, he wrote a, like a 600-page book when he was like 25 years old that I'm still trying to understand. But he wrote this um, uh, talking about self-life and the soul, and he says, many do not understand what the soul life is. Simply put, the soul life is what we commonly call the self-life. Many believers make the big mistake of not distinguishing sin from self. That's important right there. They think that sin and self are the same. However, they are different both in the teaching of the Bible and in spiritual experience. Sin is filthy, opposes God, and is utterly abominable. Self, however, may not necessarily be filthy, may not necessarily oppose God, and may not necessarily be abominable. On the contrary, many times self is quite honorable, wanting to help God. That's a powerful quote. Powerful, powerful. See, a Christian who lives by self-life in their soul, and you can be a great person, by the way. You can be nice, you can be kind, you can love God, you can do great works, you can do great deeds, but if you're governed by self-life in the soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions are governing you. They're leading you. They're the ones, they're, those, that, those, that part of your soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions are the one influencing and leading you. Even if you're nice, even if you're kind, even if you go to church, even if you give, even if you do great works for God, you can do all of that in the power of the soul, in the mind, the will, and the emotions. See, a Christian who lives by self-life in their soul is driven by what they think, feel, and want. So even though sin and self are different, when self is living rather than Christ, the natural outcome is going to be the sins of the flesh. It's almost impossible. If self is living rather than Christ, it's almost impossible. It is impossible. It is impossible not to eventually produce the fruit of the flesh. You will produce the fruit of the flesh. Pride, jealousy, lust, ambition, idolatry, whatever it is, you will do that. Now, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I want to talk about there's two possible states of believers. Two possible states of believers. I'm going to read from the New King James Version because I want us to see this. In fact, I want us to see this because it's so important that we understand the scriptural uh, definitions, how scripture defines certain things. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul is writing. I want you to hear this. And he says, I, brethren... 
could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal or fleshly. See, I used to think fleshly was, or carnal was basically someone, a Christian who was saved, born again, but was entangled with all kinds of lust, all kinds of issues of the flesh. It could be anger, it could be pornography, it could be, uh, you know, jealousy, it could be all these different things. But, but Paul is saying here, yeah, that's true, that it, there's a truth to that, but it's also a truth that that carnality, that the carnal, the, the carnal believer can also just be a babe in Christ. In other words, just spiritual immaturity, that if someone, if you're just, if you're born again, even whether you've been saved for five years or five minutes or 50 years, you can still be carnal and Im, if you're immature. If you're not allowed, if you're not going on to maturity, the scriptures would call you carnal. See, there's two states. There's and, and Paul says it right here. There's spiritual and there's carnal. You are either going to be spiritual or carnal. Now, in all reality, there's probably a mixture. There, in most of us, there's some kind of a mixture of being spiritual or carnal. But there's these two states that Paul is defining. And he says that I couldn't speak to you. I couldn't talk about the deeper things of God because you are carnal. You're still living by your soul. You're still living by your mind, your will, and your emotions. You're still living by the cravings of your body. They're governing you. They're dominating you. They're ruling you. And therefore, when I try to talk about the deeper things of God, you can't comprehend what I'm saying. You can't discern what I'm saying because only spiritual people can. And you're immature and a babe in Christ. That's what he's telling the Corinthians. Verse 2, I fed you with milk and not with solid food. Listen to what he says. For until now, you were not able to receive it. See, if you're living in the mind, the will, and the emotions, if you're living by what your body is craving, what your body wants, you can't receive the spiritual truth of God's word. That, that's the condition of so much of the American church. That's why the word of God being preached, or it's not even the word of God, it's the word of man being preached in so many churches today it's so different than the scriptures because they're, they're trying to speak to an audience that's carnal. And when they speak to an audience that's carnal, they can't receive the, tr the, the spiritual truths. And so therefore, it's basically milk. They're feeding them milk. See, your ability to receive the word of God is based on the part of you that's living. If your soul is in control, if your mind, your will, and your emotions is in control, you can't comprehend the spiritual truths of God's word. You have to be a spiritual person, governed and led by the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, and receiving the revelation that he gives you. Amen. Verse 3. So we see so far that a carnal Christian can be a babe in Christ, immature. A carnal Christian can be one who's not yet able to receive the word of God, the deeper things of God. You've got to receive milk. The, the, and now uh, we see in verse 3, for you are still carnal. For where there is envy, strife, and division among you, that's talking basically about the sins of the flesh. Where the sins of the flesh are in operation, where the sins of the flesh are being exhibited, Paul is saying if we see jealousy, if we see strife, if we see division among you, if we see you know, pride or human ambition or any of these fruits of the flesh, Paul's saying, that's carnal. That's carnal. It's not spiritual. And he goes on to say, are you not carnal? Listen to what he says. And behaving like mere men or women. Is what Paul is saying here is like, okay, if you are immature, if you're not able to handle the word of God, if you're, jeal if you're, if, if you're exhibiting the fruits of the flesh Paul is saying you're acting like a mere mortal, a mere man of the Edemic race, not someone who was of the new creation. I love that phrase. Paul's like, guys, you are acting like mere men. You have God dwelling inside of you, and you're acting like you're just an average Corinthian off the street. See, how many in the church have that same problem? We have everything we need for life and godliness right here. We have Christ living on the inside of us. 
But instead of being a spiritual person, governed and led by the Holy Spirit, we're acting and living like mere men of the old creation. And Paul would rebuke us. And not, not in a mean way, but he would rebuke us and say, what are you doing? You have a treasure inside of you, the Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead, the Spirit of God that created the universe has been grafted to your human spirit. You are now one spirit with God, but you are allowing your carnal mind, your soul, your body, your cravings, what you believe in your heart, you're allowing all of these things to suppress the life of God in you. And you're acting like a mere man or a woman. It goes on in verse 4. For when one says, I am of Paul, or another says, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? I mean, doesn't this describe the church today? We want our favorite teachers. I am of, you know, Frank, I don't know, Franklin Graham. I am of Mike Bickle. I am of uh, Terry Bennett or what, I don't know, whatever name you want to throw in there. He's my teacher. He's my leader. And the Lord's like, no, that's, that's carnal. That's immature. You're, you're, you're not part of a tribe. You're part of the body of Jesus Christ. That, that's carnality. You know, you would think, okay, well, you know, your favorite teacher of the month, your favorite apostle of the month, this, this is even amplified with YouTube and podcasts and books and all that, is how much we gravitate. And I'm not saying, listen, I'm not saying you can't listen to your favorite teacher. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Obviously, that's, that's true. But if, if that is your primary source of being fed rather than the Lord himself, from the Spirit and from the Word, then Paul would say, you're carnal. Well, I've been a believer for 25 years. I've been going to charismatic, spirit-filled, prophetic churches for 25 years, and I've seen it. And the Lord's like, you're not feeding off of me internally of my Word and my Spirit as your primary source, you're going to YouTube and Facebook and books and all this stuff as your primary source, rather than feeding on the Lord himself. I am of this teacher. I am of that teacher. I am of this one and that one. I belong to this tribe or that tribe. Has, is, the, is the body of Jesus Christ divided? No. That's carnal. That's immaturity. So that doesn't mean you can't, again, that does not mean that the Lord will not direct you to read a book. In fact, if you're looking for one, this one comes out October the 18th, Indwelling Life, all right? So when this comes out, just, just scratch out what I just said for about six weeks so you can read this. No, I'm just kidding. But the Lord will direct you to lead. This does not mean you can't read books. What the Lord's hitting at is your primary source, the Lord or your favorite teacher? Is your primary source a book or the Word of God? Is your primary source YouTube or the Holy Spirit? See, that's what he's getting at. And as the Lord, the Lord will direct you and the Lord will lead you and the Spirit will move you to read different sources like I'm sure and I hope he's going to convince you to read this coming out October the 18th, The Indwelling Life. So anyway, there's my little plug. And you're probably saying, well, you're carnal. Eh, maybe a little bit of carnal, but still, it'll help you grow spiritual. But so, you know, we think, okay, carnal is like these really, these Christians who are saved, but they're just lukewarm, and all they do is talk about sports, and they're into sin, and they're going to bars, and, you know, all this stuff. But carnal is whenever, you know, any of us here can be carnal. If we're living, carnality is determined by the part of your being you live by. If you live in the soul, if you live by the body, which describes about 95% of the church, even, I don't know if it's 95% in this church, but a lot of us, including me, at the very minimum, we have mixture, don't we? I mean, we have mixture. We have some measure of spirit, some measure of soul, some measure of body that's leading and governing us when God's goal is for the spirit of God to govern every part of your being. God's goal is that we would be those that follow the Lamb wherever He goes, that he become, we become bond slaves, bond servants of the Lord, that we, we are those who are led by the Spirit of God. These are the mature sons of God. 
Maturity is determined by leadership. Is the Spirit of God leading you? Is the Spirit of God governing you in your spirit? Or is your human mind, your rational mind, your emotions the one leading you? You know, we talked about last week that, that so many Christians, myself included, we tend to have this thing where like, I feel so far from God. I feel so disconnected from God. I feel a million miles away from the Lord. That's your emotions leading you because the truth is you are one spirit with him. You cannot, it's, it's, it's impossible for your, for your spirit to be closer to, 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 your, to the Lord than he, you already are because you are joined spirit to spirit to him. You are, cannot be separated. When you say, I feel far from God, when you say, I feel a million miles away from God, it's a sure indicator of your soul is the one leading, not the spirit. See, when the spirit is leading, you may or may not have feelings that, that accompany it. And if you're addicted to having feelings, you're going to miss the Holy Spirit. Because he might move in a way where you feel him, and he might move in a way where you don't feel him. He might move in a way that agrees with reasoning, or he might move in a way that is completely contrary to reasoning. And if the soul is governing, and the, the, the reasoning and the rationalization and the logic is governing, and you say, no, that doesn't fit in with my reason, that doesn't fit in with my logic, that doesn't fit in with my natural mind, that can't be the Lord, then you're going to miss the Lord because you're living from the soul. If you're addicted to feeling, if you're addicted to the, the euphoria of an experience, if you're addicted to those kinds of things, you're going to miss the Lord in your spirit when those feelings dry up because there are times in your spiritual walk with the Lord you're not going to feel anything. That doesn't mean the Lord is withdrawn for the slightest bit. That means he's still connected to your spirit, uh, spirit to spirit whether or not you feel it or not. So my point is, so much of the church right now would be characterized as either carnal or mixed between being governed by the spirit or the flesh or the soul. And so we want to, meet, we want to move into being those spiritual people. And I would even say it like this. You could say it like this, is that a, a carnal Christian is a child of God, a spiritual Christian is a mature son of God. A carnal Christian is one who is called to or is betrothed to Jesus Christ. A spiritual Christian is one who has been made ready for the, to be married to Jesus Christ. See, the wife made ready for the lamb is going to be a spiritual believer who's governed. Now, that doesn't mean super spiritual. If you've been in the charismatic church for a while, you've seen the super spiritual. And if you've been there for a long time, you realize usually the people that exhibit the super spiritual stuff are the least spiritual that you could possibly imagine. That's really the soul coming out in weird, strange ways. I've, you know, if you've been in the charismatic church for however many years we've been in, you're like, yeah, that ain't the Lord. It might look spiritual, but it ain't the Lord. <laughs> it smells just like the flesh to me. So I'm not talking about super spiritual. I'm not talking about that at all. In fact, if you're really spiritual, you'll be naturally supernatural. If you're really spiritual, you don't have to do external things. Now, God might lead you to do external things. But a lot of times people are trying to do the external things to showcase their spirituality. We don't have that. Thankfully, all the people that used to do that don't go here anymore. But <laughs> thank God. <laughs> It was like, okay, what, what's going to happen this Sunday? That was back when Dad was pastor. You know, we were, <laughs> no, I'm not saying it because it's fault, but I'm just saying it's not your fault. Yeah, yeah who's going to run around the church this Sunday? Or who's going to, like, hit me in the face with a banner this Sunday? Or blow the shofar in my ear this Sunday? I mean, you know, it's like you've seen all that stuff, and you're like, okay, those people are no more spiritual than, you know, I can't even, anyway, I don't have a good analogy. I'll, but... <laughs> If you've, seen, if you've seen the super spiritual in the charismatic church, that's not what I'm talking about. That is not what Paul means. Paul means that we are led and governed by the Spirit of God. The soul and the soul's need to be seen and the soul's need to be praised and the soul's need to be affirmed has been crucified so that what's done is the Holy Spirit. 
without mixture of the soul or the flesh. That's what we want to get. That's what we want to be. Without mixture. I mean, I'm jealous for that for myself. I'm jealous for that for us, that we would have no mixture. We would have that, what dad was talking about, that holy of holies relationship with Jesus without mixture, without the flesh. Amen. So let's turn to let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Is a, is a carnal Christian can also be described as a soulish Christian. It's important that we understand this because Paul is writing in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, and he says, But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. Now, it's easy to, if you, don't read, if you don't dig into the Greek and understand what Paul's saying here, that word natural man actually means uh, soulish. So you can, if you, and I, I got it in the notes, all the, the Greek, but you can look at it. The word this translated natural man is, is, is derived from the word suke, which means the soul. It means pertaining to the soul. So, you know, there's a debate about whether the natural man is a regenerated believer, a born-again believer, or just someone who has never been born again. He, Paul's probably talking here about someone who's never been born again, but there's debate about that. That's not important. But I know for, for certain that any, any person, any person who has the Spirit of God can still be soulish. When the soul is governing and not the Spirit, when the soul is governing and not the Spirit, we can still be soulish. So here's what Paul's saying, but a soulish man, even one who is born of the Holy Spirit, when the mind and the will and the emotions are governing that person, this person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him. Now, if you've ever been around Christians that that are, you know, a lot of times not, they would be not charismatic Christians. They look at that and they're like, you know, something the Lord gives a prophetic word or the Lord does some moving of the Holy Spirit. That's truly of the Holy Spirit, not the weird stuff I just described, but truly the Holy Spirit. And someone who, who they love the Lord, they read the Bible daily, they give, they're just, you know, they, they evangelize, they do all these things, but they look at that and they think, okay, that's just, I don't get that. I don't understand that. That doesn't make sense. Usually that means they are a soulish believer. They're governed by the soul. Their mind, their will, and their emotions are the one influencing and leading them, not their spirit. See, Paul's talking here, contrasting the natural man, the soulish man who does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. He cannot understand them because these things are spiritually appraised or spiritually discerned. To have true discernment, you've got to be led by the Holy Spirit. To have true discernment, your spirit has to be the strongest part of your being, stronger than your mind, stronger than your emotions, stronger than your will. Your spirit has to be infused with the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, and your spirit has to be first, your soul second, and your body third. That's how you really discern the things of the Spirit of God and how you discern that some of the things masquerading as the Spirit of God is not the Spirit of God at all. It's just charismatic foolishness. It's by those who are led by the Spirit of God. We can discern that which is of the Spirit and that which is of the soul. So I find... I find this, when I'm, when I'm talking about a carnal Christian, I find it very, very helpful to make this distinction between a car, you know, I, I, like to say a, I like to say a soulish Christian is governed by the mind, the will, and the emotions. A carnal Christian is, is governed by the soul and the body. And, and, and sometimes they can be different. Sometimes they can be distinct. So let me just say it like this. In summary, a carnal Christian can describe a believer who is given over to the sins of the flesh, common in the common uh, use of that word, 
Or a carnal Christian can describe an immature, soulish believer who is governed by their mind, will, or emotions. See, uh, if you really, really break it, it's not until the Word of God comes and divides between the soul and the spirit that you can realize how much I'm governed and led by my thinking, how I feel, and what I want, rather than the inward revelation, the inward knowing that comes in your spirit through your connection to the Holy Spirit. See, the, the spiritual man is spirit first, soul second, body third. The soulish Christian is soul first, body second, spirit third. The carnal Christian, the one that's governed by the flesh, is body first, soul second, spirit third. See, we want to be those who are led by this inward, the inward Holy Spirit is governing and leading us. <clears throat> so that's, that's, what, that's the, the distinction here. And so a spiritual Christian, like I said, is, is, uh, discerns all things. Now, this is very important. Let me read this in the notes here. Is often a Christian will not be completely carnal or spiritual. Instead, their life will be characterized by a mixture of the body, the soul, and the spirit influencing and leading. So let's, let's show some, this, the next slide here. <clears throat> the life source, I'm going to just read this so you just slow down and just ponder this for a second. The life source that you choose determines the type of fruit you produce, and that is without effort, okay? The, the natural organic fruit you produce is dependent on the life source you choose. Living selfishly produces the fruit of the flesh. Living by Christ's life produces the fruit of the spirit. Selfishness suppresses the spirit, while selflessness releases the spirit. See, when we're living selfish, and, and we know, all of us know what that's like. When we're living selfish, what happens is the spirit of Christ in you is suppressed. The life of God is now dormant. The, the release of God's life is now uh, inactive, so it's not being released. If you live by self-life in your soul, it will hinder the life of Christ from flowing freely from your spirit to produce fruit. See, we want to be a spiritual Christian. Not a super spiritual Christian, but a spiritual Christian. We want to be a spiritual Christian. So what does that look like to be a spiritual Christian? Because if we don't understand what it looks like to be a spiritual Christian and get a vision of what it means to be a spiritual Christian, we will never be one who can uh, become one. The vision we have, and as we see it, as we see what a spiritual Christian looks like, it will enable us to become what we behold. So we need this vision for our lives. So what does it look like to be a spiritual Christian? I don't know. I'm going to ask Dad because, you know, I'm still learning. But a, a spiritual Christian understands the way God created them, really understands the order that God has created us, spirit first, soul second, and body third. And we yield, a, a spiritual Christian is one who yields wholly to the indwelling Holy Spirit. We don't say, Lord, you can have 95%. We don't say, Lord, you can have 99%. We say, Lord, you can have 100%. 100% of me, not with, without any, we don't, we're not reserving anything for us. We're not reserving anything for self. We're not saying, okay, but I'm going to hold on to this, or I'm going to hold on to that, or I'm going to hold on to this little corner, or I'm going to hold on to me living right here. That's still mixture. 99% means there's 1% mixture. 90% spiritual means there's 10% mixture. 50% spiritual means there's 50% mixture. See, what, how much mixture do you have? That's really the question. How much mixture do you have between the soul and the body and the spirit? How much of your living is the spirit of God? Because the spiritual Christian 
is actively waiting on the indwelling Holy Spirit. As, and just like we sang about, you are the air I breathe. I'm desperate for you. You are the air that I breathe. I'm desperate for you, Lord. I'm waiting on you. I have lived in the flesh. I have lived in the soul long enough, Lord, to know the fruit of it is ugly. Lord, I know my need. How blessed is the one who knows their need. I know my need, Lord. I know my need. I am desperate for you. That's the spiritual Christian. We've, we, we're, we're desperate. We want to know. We wait on the Lord. We're waiting in prayer. We're waiting till our spirit becomes the strongest part of our being. And we can actually feel the shift take place when the soul and the body is no longer dominant, but the spirit is now the leader. The spirit is now governing and influencing. And so then when the spirit is now leading and governing and influencing, there's a transmission of the very life and nature of Jesus Christ, his character, his life, his victory, transmitted to your human spirit, overflowing outward into your heart, soul, and body. So the Holy Spirit is now living. See, the spiritual Christian has learned how to cease striving and know he's God. The spiritual Christian waits in silence, waits in prayer, meditating until the Lord speaks. The spiritual Christian realizes, I've got to have the strength of God. I've got to have his revelation. I've got to have his mind. I've got to have his heart. I've got to have his burden. And we don't make decisions just based on what seems rational or what seems like what feels good at the moment. We're like, Lord, what are you speaking? Lord, what are you saying? What are you saying here? See, as a result, the spiritual Christian, with, the, with their spirit leading, is now governing their thoughts, governing their emotions, governing their will. So now the soul is not the leader. The soul is now the processor, the expressor, and the executor of the input that the Holy Spirit gives here. The soul has become the servant, not the leader. The soul has become the one that is now serving what the Spirit of God is saying. The Spirit of God is speaking this. The Spirit of God is releasing his life. And the soul now becomes the expressor through the emotions, the processor through the mind, the executor through the will. And the body now is servant to the soul as the soul is servant to the Spirit. Without mixture. See, the spiritual Christian has learned how to discern my own thoughts, my own feelings, my own preferences from what the Spirit of God is speaking to me here. See, what I want and what I feel and what I think may not align with what God's speaking. And so the spiritual Christian says, I don't care. I'm laying down what I want. I'm laying down what I think. I'm laying down what I feel. Because I want the Lord to be Lord in my spirit and then worked outwardly. Let's show the next slide. The spiritual Christian is led, governed, and empowered by the Holy Spirit alone. Man, I want to be there. I'm not there. I, I'm not there. I'm not even, you know, I'm like a child learning to walk on this. But I'm... I'm wanting to get there. I'm wanting to get there. That's my, one of my life visions is I want to be empowered by the Holy Spirit alone. Consequently, their soul is no longer the leader, but the processor, the mind, the expressor, the emotions, and the executor, the will of the Spirit's input. See, the soul is ready to carry out Whatever the Holy Spirit speaks, whatever the Holy Spirit reveals, whatever the Holy Spirit leads, whatever the Holy Spirit is saying, the, the, the soul is ready to carry out and release the life of God. The next slide. The spiritual Christian allows the indwelling life of Christ, this is very important, to shine through their unique personality like a prism. God does not want to kill your personality. God does not want to kill your soul. God wants to kill self-life in your soul. 
so that the life of Jesus can be expressed through the unique personality God has given you to shine the beauty of Christ inwardly here, outwardly through your soul, through your body like a prism, expressing Christ's beautiful nature through their soul. See, that's what God wants. God created you with your own personality, whether you're introverted or extroverted, whether you're, you know, you're outgoing or whether you're more reserved, however you are, whatever personality type you have, God has given you that. Now, a lot of it is exhibited by self-life living. So if, if Christ really begins to live, you're, you might see that your personality changes because some of that personality is just soul living and self living rather than Christ. What you might find is, you might have a change of personality because now you're living from a different life source. I mean, a lot of your personality that you think your personality is self-living through your soul. When Christ now begins to live, your true personality is now released because the Spirit of God is now flowing out of you like a prism, shining through your soul in the way he created you. So let's turn to Hebrews chapter 12, or chapter 4, verse 12. To become this spiritual Christian requires surgery. <laughs> I got a lot of amens when I said, let's be a spiritual Christian. I got a lot of like dad, quote dad, oh me's when I said surgery. But it's true. There's only one way we can be a spiritual Christian because we don't know the power of the soul to influence us. We don't know how much of our thinking, how much of our emotions, how much of our will is really leading us until the Spirit of God comes like a sharp laser knife to cut and divide, to partition and to separate the soul from the Spirit. And so the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is living and active. The word of God is alive. The word of God is sharp. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God comes and it pierces down to this division of the soul and the spirit. The King James Version says to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit which I think is kind of the right idea here, is that the Word of God comes and the Word of God, the living, active Word of God, penetrates and it then separates. The Word of God penetrates into your innermost being and then it separates. It partitions this intertwining that you can't really discern of what soul and what spirit. The Word of God comes and it penetrates and then it separates. And then the Word of God says, this is your soul, this is your spirit. You're living from your soul. You're living by what you think. You're living by what you want. You're living by how you feel. And the Lord says, no, live from the spirit and your union with the Holy Spirit. See, it takes the word of God. This, you can't do it by yourself. It takes the word of God and the anointing on the word of God to come in like a sharp two-edged sword to penetrate to the deepest part of our being and to divide asunder, to partition the soul from the spirit. And here's the reason. Here's the goal of it. God's goal in this dividing of soul and spirit is so that you could easily identify the life source you're living from. Are you living from self-life in your soul? Or are you living from the life of Christ in your spirit? And so when you see that, when you see self-life in your soul, and you see that division of soul from spirit, you know, so much what I thought was God, so much what I thought was the voice of the Holy Spirit. No, it's really the voice of my own emotions, the voice of my own thoughts, the voice of what I really want. If you've been in this long enough, you realize that so often the soul masquerading as the voice of the Holy Spirit is not the Holy Spirit. If you've been in the charismatic church long enough, you know we've had our fair share of soulish prophecies that did not originate from the inward Holy Spirit. They came from the soul. 
And it takes the living, active Word of God to partition that penetrating work to partition to where you know this is of the soul and this is of the spirit. And, and, Paul, and the writer of Hebrews says that it takes practice. It takes practice. You're not going to get this in one message. It takes a lifetime of practice. I'm still trying to figure out, okay, did this come from my soul? Okay, did the fact that I felt like Georgia was going to win the national championship come from my soul? Probably. Or from my spirit? Probably not. Although, never mind. Maybe it is the Lord. I don't know. No. You, you'll find out. You, uh, that's not a problem. Just a joke. But you'll, you'll you find out, okay, this is the Lord. This is the soul. The way I thought God was leading, the way I thought God was leading, not, not, again, I'm not trying to like make you get overly analytical. I'll talk about that in a second. But we need that separation of what's the soul from what's the spirit, even in the things of God. You know, j just even in the charismatic church, th there's such a little... There's such a little, there's so little of this dividing that anything that says, oh, God spoke to me, God said this, God did this, there's so little discernment now that we just say, okay, everything that we hear, everyone's saying, okay, this is God, this is not God, there's no discerning. And so sometimes you're like, okay, God must be having multiple personality disorder because one person say he's, says he's saying this, the other person is saying he's saying this, and they're totally different. They can't be the same. <laughs> Is, is we've, we've missed that ability to discern the soul from the spirit, that division of the soul from the spirit. You know, Jeremiah said, if you separate the precious, which is the spirit, from the worthless, which is the soul, then you can be my spokesman to really discern the voice of God, to discern the leading of the Holy Spirit, to discern the revelation of the Holy Spirit. You've got to be able to partition out by the word of God, by the living active word of God, what's of the mind, the will, and the emotions, what comes from the spirit and the spirit's direct revelation to your human spirit. And it takes time. It takes time to discern. It takes practice to discern that. And so in all reality, this is like peeling the layers of an onion. It's like you peel one layer of an onion and you're like, okay, I've arrived. And the Lord's like, no, you got a, an entire onion left. You peel another layer. You think you're really dividing the soul and spirit then, and you realize, no, I still have like three-fourths of an onion left. And it's this continuous process of the Lord, the Lord's word penetrating, cutting, you know, uh, going deep down inside of you to show you, Brian, you're living by your rational mind. You're living by natural strength. You're living by self-reliance and not my spirit. And it's a deep work. It's a lifelong work. It won't happen in six weeks. But I, I just want you to, to, to learn kind of what the scriptures are talking about here so that you can learn how to uh, divide this soul from the spirit so that you can live. And so remember the goal of this. The goal is for the Lord to show you what life source you're living from. Not to condemn you, but to shift you to shift you to living by the Spirit. So let's show the, the, the last slide. See, when you divide the soul from the Spirit, it helps you distinguish between soul life and spirit, the Spirit's life. Between soulish love, I mean, soulish love is better than hate, obviously, but... Soulish love is not the love of Jesus Christ. We need the love of Jesus Christ. A lot of, a lot of Christians are great at soulish love. Now, that's not a bad thing. Okay? That's not a bad thing. It's much better than being angry and grumpy and mean. But there's something higher than that. It's the love of Jesus Christ. See, the, 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 the word of the Lord comes and, and divides between soulish love and divine love, between human compassion and Christ-like kindness. Do you realize sometimes human compassion can get in the way of what God's doing in someone's life? <laughs> and, you know, again, human compassion is better than being having a hard heart. 
You know, I would much rather have human compassion than have a hard heart, but human compassion is not equivalent to the, the compassion of Jesus Christ. And so we need that division to know spiritually, is this compassion the Lord or my soul, okay? It's the division between self-centered happiness, my team wins the game, spirit-empowered joy, I have joy even if my team loses. I'm not there yet, and no, either are you. <laughs> but we want to be there between that we would separate the, the soulish emotions that come from a game. Now, again, you can, I'm, I'm kind of joking a little bit. You can have joy about a football game. But, but I'm getting to this place where your source of joy is the Holy Spirit. Between self-life and Christ indwelling life. Now, I do need to say this. You must be aware of analysis paralysis. Because part of this of what I'm talking about here is I've seen it so often as people get so overly analytical about this, like, okay, you know, I felt like I need to brush my teeth. Is that my emotions? It's like, you know, they're, they're so worried about lead, being led by the Holy Spirit that they can't even, I mean, um, obviously hope there's no one like that, but I'm exaggerating that, you know, they can't even brush their teeth or use the bathroom unless they hear the audible voice of God. So I'm not saying you have to like, every single thing you do has to come from your spirit, that, that's not what I'm saying, but where you get so analytical, okay, did this thought come from my soul? Did this come from my spirit? You know, and you get so analytical, you end up doing nothing. And I've seen that. It, it's, it's, really, it's really not good because, and this is where this, this kind of teaching should not lead us to that paralysis where we feel like, okay, we don't do anything because we're so worried about whether this came from my soul or whether this came from my spirit. And the Lord will lead you. The Lord will lead you. And as you mature in this, you'll, you'll easily detect, okay, this is my spirit, this is my soul. And, you know, it's like if, the, if you feel like, okay, you know, even, even I, I shared about this, uh, this book, In Dwelling Life, I'm, you know, I had this feeling afterwards, like, hey, I wrote all this, did, did, you know, did I just in my soul write that? And I knew it was a lie. And then, you know, someone had a prophetic word for me that knew nothing about that I was writing the book and said, you've already written a book, release it. I've, I've shared that. But, you know, so you got to be very careful of analysis paralysis where you get so analytical. Is this my soul leading me? Is this my mind leading me? Is this my emotions leading me? Is this my will leading me? If you, if you really take it back to the Lord in prayer, he is going to guide you, and you can be confident in that. See, Paul said that, Paul was writing in 1 Corinthians 4, he says, uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 4, he says, I, he says, I am conscious of nothing against myself, but I'm not by this acquitted, but the one who examines me is the Lord. See, we should let the Lord, see, here's my encouragement to you. Don't worry so much about, is this, a, is this the spirit or is this the soul? Delight in the Lord, enjoy the Lord, relax in God's presence, and he will show you. He's really, really good at showing you how selfish you are. <laughs> He's really, really good at that. He's done enough for that in my life to show me that you're, so, you know, you're living being selfish right now. Let the Lord bring it to light and you enjoy the Lord. Don't, don't fall into this paralysis where you can't do anything until you feel like it's 100% the Spirit. You know, just, just don't get into that. Just, just, allow the, just take it back to the Lord and allow the Lord to separate, allow the Lord to divide. Don't get so over, over analytical. So as we bring this to a close, as we bring this message to a close, the, the thing is, is you have everything you need for life and godliness. You are joined to the Holy Spirit, uh, spirit to spirit. You have everything you need to live like Christ, to be like Christ and the thing that hinders that release of the Spirit of God is self-life in the soul, uh, the body, the carnal life, so that as we talk about these, as we talk about these over the next few weeks, these different hindrances, you could identify these things so you can deal with them, you can renew your mind, and you can release the life of the Spirit of God right here outward so you can be the spiritual Christian we talked about. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the way 
you are leading us. Lord, I do pray that no one would suffer from analysis paralysis in this, Lord. I pray, Lord, that we would have the, the word of God coming to do surgery. Lord, come do surgery. If you, if you want the Lord to do a surgical work in you, just, just, just allow the, just raise your hands, just welcome him like this, Lord, and I have my hands raised. Lord, do surgery on us. That penetration of your word, Lord, to shine into our hearts, Lord, and show us what is of the soul and the soul leading and what is of the spirit and the spirit leading. Lord, help us not to be so over-analytical we do nothing. Help us not to be so over-analytical we don't actually do the good works you've called us to do by the Spirit of God. Let us not be afraid of being soulish. Let us, Lord, but truly have the spiritual discernment to make the distinction between what originates in the mind, the will, and the emotions, and what originates in the Holy Spirit. Let us be able to have that, the, our spiritual senses trained to discern soul from spirit. I pray, Father, that you would train us in that way, Lord, so that we could become the spiritual Christians, Lord, that you're calling us to be. Lord, do that surgery. Do that surgery in our hearts, we pray. Amen. Amen. So in the online service, God bless you.